The interview show would like to thank Lifeway Foods, It Takes Guts, and Lagunitas. Beer Speaks, People Mumble, except on the interview show. things that you say, look it, I wanted to write this. I don't want to, I don't want to publish it. I just want to write it. Sometimes. Yeah. It's good for your brain. Should, to just, no, I think you're right because sometimes people, I think the goal can't always be, I'm going to write this or I'm going to do this so other people can see it. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's just, hey, I want to, I want to do an exercise with my, like you said, with your brain. I actually spend most of my time trying to convince myself that no one will see the thing that I'm doing. Uh, even if they will. Because so, you, to why, me, why would that be? Because you can't take risks if you are thinking about all of the many different types of people who might read your work. Because all of those people have a different opinion about what they like and what they don't like, or what they've just read, or what they're about to read, or you know what their background in reading is, or what their expectations of your work are. Like All those people are going to have all kinds of opinions, and if you think about them, then you won't be able to do what's right for the story. When I grew up and I started writing, the, the idea, even if you got published, if it got published, the idea that you would hear from people was was like, eh, I probably might, I might hear from one person. Yeah. And I'll know that that person, if it's positive, is a very smart person, and if it's negative, they're insane. Uh, <laughs> but now, it, it, I, I remember there was a turning point when you'd write something, and it was just, man, I'm just, and it's good because you want to hear from people and you want some interaction, but it did start to. I did start to be filled with fear. And I also started to be filled with fear, like, what if somebody else wrote the exact same thing I wrote, or a very similar thing? The then struggle is real. Do I have to do Google things and say, oh, I wrote that, or I no. have this yeah. No, that way it leads to darkness. Yeah. <laughs> like, if you go on TV Tropes, dot org or whatever, I don't remember the address, yeah. um, but they list, like, common, you know, tropes that exist in media. And if you go on there, you'll think every idea you've ever had is terrible and has been done to death, and that you'll never come up with anything original, and you just have to take to drink. I mean, it's really good. It's just not sure a good you don't want a beer? You haven't been yeah, no, I'm, I'm good. Do, so do you, uh, I mean, what they say, they say there's only like six stories, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, you can't win in that, you can't win that battle. Right, which is why I've decided to abandon in my own uh, consumption of media this evaluation of whether something is, like, originality as, uh, like, essentially positive. So... Explain that. So, like... You know, when you're looking at a work, like a TV show, for example, you're like, well, is it original? Um, really, that's irrelevant, like, to its quality. Sure. Uh, with the caveat that it has to feel fresh, yeah. but freshness is not necessarily originality. Like, some things have been done over and over again, but they're still compelling. And I find that more interesting than, like, oh, I've seen this before. Like, of course you've seen it before. You've seen all the things before. But so what do you it's judge how they're done. What would you judge? As, like, you read a story, what, what's the best way, do you think, to judge a story? Whether it just, did I like it? Um, I don't know. Like, whether it accomplishes what it sets out to do is a, is a good question to ask. Like, I don't think any of these things are, like, the definitive way. Sure. But, yeah. like, that's assuming you can figure out what it sets out to do. But uh, does it speak to people in a way that's meaningful? Is it interesting? You know, like, all of those... Is it compelling? Does it introduce you to new ideas? Does it challenge your existing worldview? Like, those are... One thing I... So, okay, on that last point, one thing I always struggle with with a book is, should I... Is it good to relate to the book? Or is it better to say, no, this book is something I didn't relate to, so it taught me about another worldview? Or is the best mm -hmm. some kind of middle ground there? Oh, I don't know. I mean, I think uh, when works cultivate empathy or sympathy, those are, are good things. So not necessarily, uh, do I personally relate to this like as a facet of my experience, but like, do I feel for this person who I'm reading about? Okay, but the relate. I mean, I guess my question is, should I keep reading Philip Roth novels? <laughs> That's up to you. That's up to you. <laughs> I mean, what do you what do you, what do you for, read these days? I've been reading a lot of nonfiction. Yeah. Huh. Um, I uh, what did I just? I finished Smoke Gets in Your Eyes. Which is what? It's a. It's a yeah. yeah. Um, it's a book about uh, written by a woman who works at a crematory. Uh, 
or works. At her. Caitlin Dowdy is her name. Do- Smoke Doty? gets Doty. in your Doty. eyes. Smoke gets in your eyes. Smoke gets in your eyes. It's like check it out. It's a it's all about the death industry and her like experience with it, and then her she's funny. Uh, and then it's a her funny book about about cadavers. cadavers. Yes. <laughs> Emily Rasley should read the book. I really. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> it's funny. I follow Emily Rasley, the brain scoop. Brain scoop you know. just whooped. Yeah. I follow the brain scoop on Did Tumblr. That's great. Tumblr. <laughs> Chicago, curiosity, I'm into it. I also like gross things, so. Um. So it's a funny book, but it's obviously a serious book. Yeah, I mean, it's kind of about, uh, the thing I really um, latched onto in it was this idea that we try as hard as we can to separate ourselves from the reality of death by like embalming, basically. So we create these like plasticized versions of dead people, um, which like separate us from the reality of what's happened to them. But she is advocating for a more natural, like you have to confront what's actually happened. Like the decomposition of the body helps you to like let go of the person who's gone. And it's disgusting and it's hard and really visceral, but maybe that is an important experience for you to have in order to like endure grief. So, and there's a scene in the first episode, I think, of Six Feet Under that is also, um, yeah, Six Feet Under, um, that also deals with that. So I've, now that I've been reading about bodies, I see them everywhere. <laughs> like, not see dead whoa, whoa, people. Yeah, but, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Explain that. But just like, in, it's a really interesting topic of discussion, and there's a lot of books about it that deal with it in a really interesting way. Like, um, Mary Roach. Wrote a book called Stiff, I think. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, and I want to read that next, but then I needed to take a break from the dead people for a while. What? What? Uh, do you think that we have a? I mean, I guess the cliche would be that we have an unhealthy view of death in society that we ignore it. Do I think th- inevitably, yes. Like one way or, or another. But I don't, don't you think about it all the time? Do I, I think about it? All? You, no. everybody. No. I pretend that I'm immortal. That's my problem. Huh. Yeah. See, I pretend I'm I'm near death at almost. <laughs> at what point did you start doing that? Is my question. It happens around 35. I'll be okay. honest. No, really. I, I, had, I we've had John Green on, and John Green, you start talking about death, and he won't shut up about it. Mm-hmm. I mean, maybe it's all. a writer thing. We're just all obsessed with death. But you're I not. Everybody. Yes. Yeah. I mean, I mean, I guess there's some people who probably never think about it, but mm. but I would imagine that it's something that, you know, it's like it's like God. If you, I, my theory is if you believe in God or don't believe in God, you're always thinking about the possibility of God mm. or religion or where you came from or something like that. You just well, can't avoid certain things. Right, and I don't think you should, which is why I think it's important to address some questions about existence in any work about teenagers especially because I can't think of a time when like thoughts about you know, my inevitable like death and what would happen and what I was supposed to do now and what I believed about the world. Like, I don't remember a time when those questions were more cl- close to me emotionally than when I was young. Uh, Why was, do you think that is? Well, it's the first time encountering it? Well, yeah, you're starting to understand that the world is much bigger than you are. Like, I, I think of uh, growing up as like the, this like gradual expanding of the world. So when you're young, it's your house then that, and you are the center of it. You know, like everything revolves around me and then like this is a developmental you know, stage. You know my five-year-old. Yeah, I know, yeah. yeah, totally. Yeah. Well, they're incapable of understanding that. Like, there's a there's a really cool. I don't remember what stage it is because I I don't know the science. But um, there's like a stage where a child realizes that other people are separate from them and that they are independent. Like they can move themselves and other people are moving themselves. Like that there's different. Yeah. Anyway, yeah, okay, I'm not explaining this well. No, I understand. But um, I think that happens more and more as we get older. So you're a teenager, and suddenly the world is bigger, uh, and you have to figure out like what's the right way for me to fit into it, and like you have to deal with this feeling that you're not as important as you once thought you were, which is hard. But isn't the isn't the rap on teenagers often you're selfish, you're obsessed with yourself, blah blah blah. Well, of course you are. <laughs> I mean, everybody is. I yeah. Guess, certainly... Well, yeah. I mean, that's I think the funny part is that like the idea that we become not obsessed with ourselves at some yeah. point in adulthood is a big lie. Like you don't grow out of that. You have Son, to. Son, you're obsessed with yourself. <laughs> you should be obsessed with me, like I am. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Uh, re- real quick, fear. Fear is a theme that is recurrent in the Divergent trilogy, mm-hmm. and I think one character in it might be four who says something like. Your fears will always be 
be with you, your, your basic ultimate fear. That is four, good job. Yeah. Uh, I don't remember parts of it anymore either, <laughs> I should tell you. <laughs> I wrote that? I wrote that? Yeah. yeah, well it's been a while since I've read them, <laughs> oddly. Well, no. I mean, why would you? Why would you say, I need something to read? Oh, I wrote this. I'm gonna write, I read about me, because I'm selfish, I, don't, I guess. Shouldn't that be our explanation? No. But obviously it's a character, so a character saying that, and it's not necessarily reflective of you, but do you believe, and I, and I think there's real wisdom in what, what Four said, that, that your greatest fears never do leave you. Oh, I don't know. I mean, I have to, it's hard because I do on many levels believe that, but I also have to have hope for fear changing over time because otherwise I'll always be just as anxious and neurotic as I am now. <laughs> And, and what's well, the point can, of going to therapy, really? Well, well, there's a difference between saying I can, I can still do something, I can push through it, but, but it's still like I think that's what the characters in the book do actually. Like they go on these simulations, and Four has these over and over again the same fears, but that doesn't mean he can't use those simulations or use that therapy to to then be able to exist outside of them if right. that makes sense. Well I'd have to I feel like I want to talk to someone who has over who has done like exposure therapy to overcome, you know, a particularly like understandable fear, like a the fear of heights or something. So they'll put you in like in a glass elevator and <laughs> make you But those panic aren't your, those aren't your darkest fears. Maybe That's not. That's a surface level fear. Right, like nothing against people who have fear of heights. <laughs> Some things are really high. <laughs> I'm afraid of heights. Not that afraid of heights. No. But well, normal. I, mean, I would every, never do. Nobody's like, oh, stuff. I love heights, and I don't care what happens to me. Some there. people are, I think. Yeah. Yeah, like my sister's gone fear skydiving and fear of lows. Like, yeah, I don't like being. The on lower the I am to the ground. The when I was a child and I was shorter, <laughs> it's much harder. <laughs> so, so well, I'm, I'm congrats that you have a, a book, at least if not completed, but but in the point. Yeah, where, rough draft. Rough draft. Well, that's yeah. good. And and well, give, give us just just give us like a year. I'm not asking for the plot. I'm not asking to give anything away, but 2017? Two, yeah, 2017. 2017, uh -huh. new book from Veronica Roth. Veronica Roth. Guests on the interview show all share one thing in common. They take risks. We'd like to thank Lifeway Foods, makers of probiotic kefir, for making possible this week's It Takes Guts interview. So, so to back up a little bit, so my job, I'm, I'm the chief curiosity correspondent at the Field Museum. I, I correspond the, essentially I'm like an in-house journalist, like a science communicator. So one of our senior curators is studying naked mole rats and he's studying about like deep time evolution of the naked mole rats and he goes back in time in the fossil record and he understands like naked mole rats are so freaky that they ought to be their own mammalian family. But then that like you have to talk about, you know, what is taxonomy? Why do, why do all these things have these funny Latin names? So it Does he believe that because they're freaky or because he studies them? Both. I mean, everybody would yeah. think what they study is, is Super cool. But it, yeah, I mean, super cool for one, but super freaky in that you're looking at this thing and you're like, man, this just went totally off the radar. You look like 60 million years ago, what was happening? I don't know. Uh, naked mole rats. <laughs> so I don't know, I, I take a sense of humor and I approach these topics and try to help other people care as much as I do about those things that are obscure and weird. Well, I'll say one thing about you is that you get so excited about what you do that you A, you make me excited about what you do, but you also make me excited about what I do and about other things. Because I think, well, if she's so excited about this, why should I go around in a big mope all the time? Oh, right. <laughs> Man, I like, 
I kind of wake up in an existential crisis every day. You wake really? up and you're just like, oh man, I'm a product of 4.567 billion years of history. I can't handle this. Yeah. <laughs> and I gotta pay car insurance today? This is too much. My existential crisis is a lot different, but but I share no, that's the crisis part. Yeah. Let me ask you this. I, w I was actually gonna ask you this, and and uh, now I see that you have the the raccoon. I had to bring my coon on your on your sweater. Coon and, represent. And are there are there any animals you hate? Because that's I, I mean raccoons are not the most lovable Golly. creatures. I mean raccoons are pretty great. Defend them. Defend the raccoon. Defend the raccoon. I yeah. mean. So, so to backtrack a little bit, I, I have this affinity for raccoons because I found a, a taxidermied one that was like shoved behind a cabinet and it turned out that I took it out from behind the cabinet and we didn't know anything about this raccoon in this museum I was working in, put it in the bird room and then the first episode of, of my program, The Brain Scoop, we filmed, this raccoon is in the background and my producer is just like, what's up with the coon? He's in the bird room. Like, and I was like, I don't know, he follows me everywhere. So we thought it would be funny to kidnap a taxidermied raccoon and put it in the background of every single episode of The Brain Scoop. Somewhere. Yeah, somewhere. Yeah. So now we're 130 episodes in, and I still think it's hilarious. Um, don't That's know like if anybody Hitchcock. else. He was in all his movies. Yeah, so we thought it was funny. Um, so, but but then raccoons really started to grow on me, and and they're this underappreciated mammal. They've been so adaptive. Like we've practically done everything to to shoo every other life form out of our immediate environment, right? Like we have rats and pigeons and seagulls and raccoons. Yeah. Like that's all we've afforded ourselves. We've been like, everything else sucks. Like we're better than that. We're gonna <laughs> do everything we can to displace natural ecosystems and everything else can go out. But raccoons are just like giving us the finger. They're just like, no, I'm not. Yeah. I'm gonna adapt. I'm I mean, gonna that's get people, your dumpster. Uh, some people I know, <laughs> you know, I, I didn't know this. We had two raccoons in our yard the other day. Yeah. And then they started climbing a tree. Yeah. I didn't. I just thought they climbed garbage cans. No. They, <laughs> they existed pre-garbage cans. Trees <laughs> were there pre-garbage. You know what's funny is is so uh, we recently transplanted um, out of the city. So so now I'm in this in right. this suburban environment. Well, I can't tell you that. People on the internet are weird. Does so, it have the word forest or park in the name? <laughs> <laughs> so I so I was taking I take my trash out and this raccoon somehow got trapped into it and the thing lunges at me. I mean it had been trapped in this dumpster, you know, got in there, thought it got the highlight of the evening, and then somebody shuts the lid and it gets stuck. I opened it up and this thing just like jumps out at me, jumps over my shoulder and goes behind the garage and I freak out. My first thought is not like, oh, raccoon. It was like, I thought we were cool. <laughs> I thought we were cool. Like I've been, I've been carrying you around with me everywhere. I've been I have preaching a sweater. the word. I got a, bought this at JCPenney on sale last weekend. Like, I thought we were cool. Did you have the sweater on at the time? No, I didn't. Okay. I think Maybe I, yeah, that might have changed things. Yeah. Uh, what about defend the um, what's the, the ostrich? The ostrich? Yeah. What's wrong with ostriches? I don't know, they scare kids. You can eat them. Can you? Yeah. <laughs> what's wrong with them? You can eat them. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, ostriches are fine. I you know, creepy crawlies are are creepy crawlies. I ever, we just did an episode actually. Uh, we filmed two episodes on Tuesday with we have uh, a resident curator. She's an expert on millipedes and spiders. Okay. She's an arachnologist. Sure. And so you don't I think, have to tell me the term. I know it. <laughs> but I didn't. I didn't know because she's in the insect division. So I'm like, everybody studies insects, just bugs, you know, ants and, and beetles and things. No, she studies. She's specifically things with more than six legs. Okay. So already she's like yeah. leagues ahead of the rest of us. Um, <laughs> but we were cleaning out our garage and. There are spiders everywhere. Like nobody had opened that garage in I want to say like 500 years. Like it's just nobody's yeah. touched it. Yeah. And so I have a broom and you're sweeping them off and you have like 800 spiders that are dangling down and I'm trying to like channel my inner inner like Dr. Petra Searwald, who's who's our arachnologist. Not like, Petra wouldn't be afraid. Petra wouldn't be afraid. And I like drop the thing and I have to go inside and like take a shower because I was just like just these irrational fears and the, 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 that's the one part of me that's irrational fears and the other part of me that cares so much about like being an advocate for the spiders and it's just a really weird balance yeah yeah i mean I the feel, struggle's real mark no but what i'm emily what i would say to you is is i think both can can coexist yeah you know what i'm saying you can say every single spider that does not come in contact with me i love i'm trying to cohabitate <laughs> yeah. we're trying to cohabitate right now we've got we've got a, a grass spider who just took up residence in our pantry and i'm Trying to be cool about it, but what about the fly, the common house fly, which implies that they're in your house? Would you, would you kill it? It if depends it's in your on. House? It depends on 
Which how many of its babies it's laying in my dinner, you know? Yeah. That's well, okay, gross. let's say 10,000 babies. That's, that's, that that exceeds possible? my ratio Two of flies do that? <laughs> I mean, just, if I've got to have like one house fly and 10,000 maggots in my peaches or no house fly, I got you. I'll go with the 10,000 maggots. And in I my think peaches. any reputable person at the Field Museum would choose what you chose. Hey, yeah. was the, were people at the Field Museum talking about this new human ancestor? You know, I'm sure they were. Um, I, I honestly, I, I sit online. I'm, I'm more concerned about what Tumblr is saying about it. Because like every people at the Field Museum, they're, they're gonna, they're gonna be in on, on the deal. Like yeah. you know, they know about it. They're yeah. part of the cool circle. And I'm more concerned about like, how is the public responding to this? Like, do we care? Is this a thing we care about? Turns out it's a thing we care about, which is great. Yeah. Uh, good for us. But they, the people on Tumblr, correct me if I'm wrong, in large part don't know as much about it as the people at the Field Museum. <laughs> That's true, but, but I am... Nothing I'm, against people on Tumblr. <laughs> it's just that they have other Are you just, Have you been on Tumblr? Because I'm pretty sure we're the like world's experts on everything on Tumblr. Because they will <laughs> tell you. Um, no, it's, it's, it's actually been really exciting to read about it. Um, um, one blog that I follow, they, they follow another blog of one of the um, research scientists. You know, because they had to get all of these, like, tiny women to go into this cave space mm -hmm. because the, all of the human remains were within like a seven inch gap in the cave. So they had to find tiny people who were experts. So it was like a great time for women archeologists because they're like mm, tiny women, ladies. How, what do you mean, how tiny? Like tiny enough to tiny get into women. a seven inch gap to go get the, to excavate the To get into a seven inch. In this cave. Yeah, and so so what's great about that is that like I, I found one of these ladies on Tumblr. She's like, I, this is what I've been working on for two years. Couldn't tell you guys anything. I'm one of the tiny ladies. <laughs> <laughs> it was just it was a great. I felt really good about it. I don't know. I had nothing to do with it. You're not tiny. No. No. No, I couldn't have done it. Yeah. No, yeah, my mom true. always said I wouldn't be a ballerina. <laughs> <laughs> my mom too. Yeah. <laughs> What what percentage of the muse, of the field museum or I guess any museum of that of that nature does the public get to see? One percent. Jesus. One percent. Yeah. And it's like thirty bucks to get in. No. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Why, I mean that. What I mean that's both amazing because when you do go to the field museum, it's amazing. It's fun. And then just to think of all the other stuff that's there, and then I guess your job basically is to show the yeah. world the stuff that ninety nine percent. Yeah, you know, a lot of when we go when you go to the museum, you see all you see like the highlights. You know, you see we've already taxidermied the elephants, we've already articulated the giant T-Rex. It's the largest most complete T-Rex. You can only have one largest most complete T-Rex, right? Until you find another one. And then it's probably going to end up like at AM and H. Damn it. Um, but so so we put you put the the engaging things, the visual like appealing things on display, the things that can best illustrate the story that you're trying to tell. But Natural history museums, their primary function is to be function is to be repositories. So imagine, you know, Chicago, what Chicago looked like 200 years ago. And we can never recreate that ecosystem. But we're really lucky that we had some weirdos at the time who decided, like, man, I'm going to collect every single beetle that I can find. Just yeah. going to do it. It's a thing to do. And so now those <laughs> things have to go somewhere. They have to be in a library well, where they'll be accessible. So we can go back and we can imagine, like, Man, what did this place look like before we had the dumpsters and the skyscrapers? <laughs> I just, I actually really love this image. Oh, well, this, uh, this honestly. Is this new? It's pretty, you, yeah, when you were here before, it wasn't. Yeah. This, this is my favorite view of the city. Because to me, this says the city. Yeah. Out in the distance are the gleaming towers. But right here in the, in the immediate present are the dumpsters. Yeah, <laughs> and the raccoons. I mean, that's the ecosystem I want to be a part of. Emily yeah. Grassley, everyone. Oh, thank you. Does the president and do you get hurt by attacks? And I've been through, you know, 150 campaigns and a lot of stuff. So, uh, uh, but I will say, you know, it's never pleasant. 150 I campaigns? What's your record? Uh, it's, it's, it's good. Yeah. <laughs>
The interview show would like to thank Lifeway Foods, It Takes Guts, and Lagunitas. Beer Speaks, People Mumble, except on the interview show.